Father, we come to you for this midweek service. We thank you once again for the opportunity to just come and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for each and everything you do in our lives. We just pray, Lord, we continue to be able to worship you. We pray, Lord, that Jesus will return soon. That We know that the days are getting dark and grim, but we know that you're still in control. And but we know that the uh, signs are out there. You told us to pay attention to the signs, and the signs are there, Lord, that, that we know that the uh, great tribulation is not far around the corner. And so that means that your return is not far around the corner. And so, Father, we do pray, Lord, that <clears throat> many people might get saved before that time so they do not have to go through the tribulation and, and, and suffer the things of the Antichrist, and that uh, many souls might be won for you. We pray, Lord, that the church... You know, we read every day over and over things that how the churches are constantly, you know, read the article about the United Methodist Church, how it had a drag show there at church and stuff like that, Lord, and with children and so forth. And and, and it's just a sad state that, you know, as the author said, it's bad enough that it was in a bar, but, but when you're ha having this thing in a church, that uh, it shows you the, the sign of the, one of the signs that, the times of how the church is that, that um, the church is, as we've been studying in Revelation, is truly the compromising church. And and uh, as you said, well, I even find faith when, when Jesus said, well, I even find faith when when He returns. And and, and it's getting hard pressed to do that, Lord. That that uh, those in the church are just sad, and, and and it's just you know they all approve of tattoos and drinking, dancing, and all the other things, and out there pushing the LGBT and abortion and all these type of stuff, Lord. That, as I said, it's the church that needs to wake up in this world so that we can bring a great revival, so that we might be able to try to win souls. So, Father, I do pray that that will be, people will be convicted, and people will go out there and start trying to witness for you. And so, Father, we just ask your blessings on this service. Thank, the, thank you for those that are here and listening online. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be continuing our study here on Zechariah. This will be Zechariah part 37. We're getting near the end. And um, we're in the final chapter of chapter 14 of Zechariah. And we were looking at it a little bit last week about how we were talking about how when Jesus returned at the end of the Great Tribulation, that he would step on the Mount of Olives. And it would split, and it would cause this uh, great valley to allow the uh, Jews to escape from Jerusalem, to escape from the Antichrist. But then they would actually also use that same valley to come back to, uh, you know, with the Lord's help, they would defeat the Antichrist. And then we also saw how it was going to form this uh, living waters that were going to go from the temple from outside of it, from, you know, from the temple, and then it would go off to one side of it, would go to the um, Mediterranean Sea, and the other one would go to the Dead Sea. You know, refers, it talks about in here the former sea and the hinder sea. And it's going to, it would flow during the summer and winter because it's living water, so it's always there. It's not going to dry up in a desert or anything like that. So we saw those kind of things. And, you know, as I said, that that all is going to take part, you know, that, that part there, all those things, it's going to be referring to during the millennium, where the Jesus, you know, it, it, that living waters is representative of Jesus there. You know, Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, provides us the living waters. You know, we see that in the book of John that Jesus spoke of. And so, you know, we, we see that we also read last week how there's living waters that come out of the throne up in heaven. You know, again, remember everything here on earth is just a pattern of things that are up in heaven. You know, these are all examples, they're types, shadows, and so forth of the real things. So, we're going to pick it up in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 10. So, we'll take a look at it there. So, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 10. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. And it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place, from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's wine presses. So this verse seems to be showing how all of Jerusalem 
will be made a plain in the area around it. The city will possibly be greatly expanded from Geba to Ramon. Now, Geba was a part of the tribe of Benjamin, as seen in Joshua chapter 21, verse 17. If you would, turn to, keep your finger here, turn to Joshua chapter 21, in verse 17. Let's see where it talks about Geba and how it was actually part of um, the tribe of Benjamin. Just to kind of give you some clue, you know, if you if you actually look you know, that um, Jerusalem, you know, and like Bethlehem and so forth, you know, it actually was, you know, uh, you know, like Jer Jerusalem was actually a part of uh, the tribe of Benjamin, and so, you know, we're going to see that. Where the, I'll mention it a little bit in a minute, what a little bit about the city, but so Joshua chapter twenty-one verse seventeen. Joshua way up in the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Joshua chapter 21. Okay, Joshua chapter 21, verse 17. And out of the tribe of Benjamin, Gibeon with her suburbs. Geba with her suburbs. So we see there that... Um, you know, since out of the tribe of Benjamin, so it's got, you know, and then it mentions, you know, Gibeon with her suburbs and Geba with her suburbs. So, you know, Geba is a part of Benjamin. All right, go back to uh, Zechariah chapter 14. But it, it is said that Geba was six miles to the northeast of Jerusalem. You know, it doesn't exist today, and we're not 100% sure always on all these things, it, you know, from Scripture, but it's believed that it was about six miles northeast of Jerusalem. Remember, that's what I said. Jerusalem was actually part of the tribe of Benjamin, which is one reason why Benjamin, you know, God had Benjamin stay with when the, when the nation split. Because remember, he kept one tribe for, he kept Judah. It says he kept one, uh, he kept, you know, he had the 10 northern tribes. The Levites basically stayed with the, um, the southern tribes there. And, you know, since they weren't, they weren't really part of their own, they didn't have any land, you know, so they weren't on their account. So you had the tribe of Judah because that was the tribe of David. So, you know, God said he would keep for the tribe, you know, for David, he'd keep that part. Then he said he'd keep one tribe for the city of, for his city, Jerusalem. Well, that was Benjamin because that was Benjamin's territory. That's why Benjamin was there with Judah. So they had those two tribes, but, you know, that, we see that it's not that far away, but... <clears throat> I mean, in one sense it is, but it's uh, you know about six miles. Now, now Rimon is said to be about thirty-five miles southwest from Jerusalem. So you got six miles to the northeast of Jerusalem would have been the Skiba, and then Rimon believed to be about thirty-five miles southwest from Jerusalem. So it is believed that this entire plain will become part of Jerusalem as the city is greatly expanded in order to provide an area for the millennial temple in a plain, as well as the government of Jesus and all the people who will be coming to Jerusalem. You know, there's different opinions on this. So, you know, it, it may not necessarily mean that this all becomes part of Jerusalem, but maybe it's just more of the whole area becomes a plain, but it's not necessarily these other surrounding areas. You know, there might still be suburbs and not necessarily part of Jerusalem. But, you know, we've seen that. You see that all the time. In, in cities, whether here in the United States or elsewhere, even in other nations, where they, they keep expanding. You know, they, they started out one size. You know, even Jerusalem itself in Israel, it's, it's much bigger than what, what it used to be. That, uh, you know, they expand outside to their, their sizes, that, you know, that uh, as, as people more get more people and the growth of it and so forth. And remember, during, you know, we've seen there with, during the Feast of Tabernacles, where all kinds of people have to come to Jerusalem. To celebrate this and so forth, you know, and of course Jesus Himself be ruling and reigning from there. So you know, He'll have His government there, His people ruling and reigning with Him and so forth. And then we'll have, um, you know, like I said, people just want to come there to worship and so forth. So 
you know, in one in one sense, you're going to need more area, you know, just for a plane. You know, you don't want to be stuck up, you know, up on a mountain or this or that or up in a valley or, you know, down a valley or something. So, you know, that's probably why it gets made to be a plane. Now, like I said, whether that's all going to be 100% part of Jerusalem or not, you know. But it says, the verse continues by saying that the, the land around Jerusalem, including Jerusalem, will be lifted up and will be inhabited. You know, it seems that Jerusalem and the land from Geba to Ramon will be made a higher elevation than it is now. You know, maybe this is done in order to make the temple more visible to people at a distance and place the focus on Jesus. You know, it doesn't really say it, but that's what it seems to be implying here is that this plane will be lifted up. You know, right now Jerusalem's already kind of on a little hill. And of course, the Temple Mount is on, you know, the highest point within Jerusalem. But, you know, they always talk about in Scripture you know, going up to Jerusalem, you know, obviously now spiritually that meant, you know, that you were going in the right direction, but also physically Jerusalem is at a higher elevation than the surrounding area. So, you know, you had to walk up a hill to get there. You know, it's not super huge mountain, but it's, it's still uphill. And, but it appears that all of it's going to lift up now, you know, and it's not just Jerusalem, but it seems to be this whole area that it mentions this plain from Giba to Ramon. You know, which it says that's south of Jerusalem. Said, you know, so the verse does say that at least Ramon is south of Jerusalem, but maybe they'll, you know, include Skiba. I don't know. But the, uh, you know, it seems that that's all going to be lifted up. And again, maybe that's just to put more of a focus on the temple or, you know, who knows why, you know, if nothing else, it's kind of like that elevation that, you know, you always had uh, things on higher ground. You know, we always think of how the, the, um, People used to worship all the false gods in, you know, up on the up on the mountains or in higher elevations and stuff. But, you know, originally that kind of started even with Abraham, you know, that it wasn't necessarily a, a heathen thing. They kind of took it over a little bit, but, you know, it wasn't, wasn't, but it, it might be, as I said, you know, kind of like we do that now, secularly, where you'll build something that you want to be noticed. You put it up on a higher elevation so everybody sees, you know, so you go into a city, you see this big main uh whatever thing it is you want to see. And, you know, that might be the thing. So it kind of puts the focus on so people see that temple. They know that that's where Jesus is ruling and reigning from. You know, that he wants people to see this from a far distance or something. But whatever the reason is, you know, Scripture does not really say, so you don't speculate so much. And, and, you know, but whatever the reason is, you know, God has a reason for it. And it seems to me that that's what it's implying here. But, you know, could be wrong, but. Now, the last part of the verse seems to give the dimensions of Jerusalem that are lifted up. So it, it may only apply to this section where the temple is located and not all of Jerusalem from Giba to Ramah. Because see, then at the end it says, And it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place. But then it says, From Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, under the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel under the king's wine presses. You know, and if you study scripture, you know, you can remember that Jerusalem was surrounded by these uh, ten gates and so forth. And then, so you had these various gates, and then you had, uh, you know, there's a tower nearby, and, you know, all these things like this. And they're just talking about the Tower of Hananiel, where they, you know, that was the kings where they, they, they uh, squashed all the grapes to make grape juice and so forth. And so the... Um, you know, it's, it, it almost seems that the end part of the verse, that it's not the whole, uh, all of Jerusalem and all this plain, like I just said, it's elevated, that it makes more sense that it might just be this area here, which is basically like the Temple Mount, you know, where the Temple Mount is now, and then, you know, a little bit more or something. So, because remember, the new, the, the, the uh, Temple, the Millennial Temple, if you look in Ezekiel from chapters 40 through 48, it talks all about it. It's actually going to take up the entire Temple Mount. You know, it's not like the old temples where, you know, they just took up one section. Like in theory, if there is going to be another, you know, it seems to be that there's going to be another temple during the uh, tribulation. You know, there's some say that that's not true or whatever, but regardless, whatever, that even if it's not, then the older temples that were there, then they were actually located just off to the side of where the Dome of the Rock is. You know, people always say that, well, you can't have a temple built there because the Dome of the Rock's there now and, and the Muslims and stuff. And they'd start this Third World War and all that. But 
it's going to get rebuilt because regardless, Scripture says so. Plus, it doesn't matter because in theory, you don't have to, you know, destroy the Dome of the Rock. That it could be, you know, off to the side. You know, it's not too far away, but there's just a little bit of a gap in between that has been measured off that it could actually still be built there. So, but it, my point is that you could have both of those up there that is still on that Temple Mount where the new temple during the millennium, it's going to take up the entire Temple Mount. So at that point, then definitely you cannot have the Dome of the Rock there, which, you know, Jesus never allowed, you know, um, um, Islam, you know, Muslim mosque anyway. So, of course, there won't be any Muslims when the millennium starts. And there won't be any Muslims during the millennium either, for that matter. But, so, you know, it's possible that it's just this area that it, it mentions here about, you know, from the, Benjamin's gate under the place of the first gate under the corner gate and as I said from the Tower of Hananiah under the King's wine press that it that it's just this area that gets lifted up so you know I'm, it's not 100% clear at least not to me that you know it seems to be you know some say that it's the whole plane that gets lifted up which I can see that to a point but it does seem to almost just say that it's just this area which you know in one sense it make more sense because you know then that way it's just really focusing on on the on the temple where Jesus is, rather than necessarily just the whole city of Jerusalem and so forth, the surrounding area. But I could also see the other point too, because with all the massive crowds coming in and so forth, but regardless, so you can make your own determination, ask God, see if he'll open, you know, give you an understanding or something. Well, let's move on to Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 11. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. So Jerusalem will be inhabited, as we saw in the previous verse, and will never again be destroyed or seek destruction. Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt many times in history, probably more than any other city, but it will never see destruction again. You know, I, I didn't look it up again. I don't remember how many times it's been destroyed, rebuilt on, and so forth. But it, it's had its fair share. If it's not the most in history, it's definitely one of the cities that ranks up there within the top of having been destroyed the most or having been rebuilt on. or You know, because there are times it wasn't like completely destroyed, but then it would always be getting rebuilt because part of it would be destroyed or, you know, whatever. And then other times it was completely destroyed and then just rebuilt on, you know. These older cities, that's one reason why they, they kind of get built up on a hill. It's because they were just covered up with dirt, and then they would build on top of it. That's why when they, these archaeologists, when they start digging a lot of times, they'll find something, and underneath the layer, they'll find, you know, here's the bottom of this sea. Well, then they dig underneath that, and then they find, well, there, here's this parts of the old city. And then you dig under that, and then, you know, well, there's so many, how many feet? And then, you know, there's parts of the other, you know, because they, they just, Buried them, you know, covered them all. You know, it's like kind of like at a, at a landfill. They just, uh, you know, a big dump where they go and they they um, cover up all the garbage with dirt. And then, you know, they just put more garbage and then they covered up more dirt. And eventually it just builds this big hill. Well, that's kind of what was done here. But so, you know, Jerusalem, that's one reason why it was, you know, kind of getting higher up all the time. But it, uh, you know, it had, it's had its fair share of being destroyed and rebuilt and so forth. And, you know, God says that that's not going to happen anymore. You know, once the millennium comes, you know, you're going to see it be getting destroyed some again, once again, during the uh, Great Tribulation, there in Battle Armageddon and so forth. That, you know, it's going to have some destruction done. And, you know, with the earthquake, remember the earthquake itself is going to uh, destroy part of the city and, you know, it gets... Uh, split into three sections and so forth. But once the millennium starts, you know, as I said, Jesus is going to be rolling and reigning from there. And there's not going to be any more, you know, it, it'll be all rebuilt. And there's not going to be, once again, it'll never be destroyed again. Not until, you know, the new heaven and new earth come. And then, of course, then with the new earth, then the, uh, you know, new Jerusalem will come down from heaven. But the people will dwell in safety and will not fear anymore. You know, Jesus is with them and will protect them. You know, it says it tells the scripture that we don't need to worry that, you know, if God is for us, who can be against us? That, you know, they have God, you know, Jesus, you know, who is God. And he's physically right there with them. I mean, I know we, you know, Jesus is around now. You know, it says we're two or three again in my name and so forth. He's in the midst. But, <clears throat> you know, that Jesus is always around. 
But I mean, he's physically going to be there, you know, and it's always a little bit more comfort when you can physically see something or whatever versus, you know, we, we take everything by faith now and, and it's, um, you know, so, you know, you don't have, they're not going to have to worry about, you know, people trying to attack him. Because remember, Jesus will be ruling with a roll of rod, a rod of iron so that, you know, he's not going to allow the rebellion. And, you know, if anybody wanted to attempt to try to come after Jerusalem, then he would immediately, you know, put a stop to it. Basically put a stop to it before it even got more than a thought. But now, when Jesus, as I said, is for you, who can be against you? Let's look up... Uh, that scripture that I was just talking about here, just so you know that it's really in, in scripture and I'm not making it up. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 31. So Romans chapter 8, verse 31. You know, I think this is something always important, to, especially, uh, you know, it's going to come to this point here in the United States as we get more and more, two Christians get more and more persecuted by the liberals. But the, uh, you know, you see this in Muslim nations or in the Hindu you know, over in India and in different places where, these Christians are being attacked, you know, communist nations and so forth. And, um, you know, it's important to remember these things because they, they see these things that, you know, they get attacked by their enemies all the time, but they need to remember that, you know, if God's on our side, that's all we have to remember. Just make sure you're always on God's side. So look at Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You know, so, I mean, that, that should be something to, to comfort us. And so, you know, that'll be something that, that there'll be during the millennium, you know, the people living there, inhabiting in Jerusalem will have that comfort, you know, knowing that, that um, you know, they'll never have to worry about, about anything because Jesus is with them. So, you know, they're, they're not going to, you know, now, you know, the people over there today, you know, there's always that fear, you know, everybody hates Israel and especially Jerusalem because they know that it's God's, you know, God's chosen city and just like the, the Jewish people are God's chosen people. And so, you know, that's why there's always these big disagreements over allowing Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel and, you know, type of stuff like that. And the, and the Palestinians, you know, the fake people, they always want to go and, and um, you know, try to attack Jerusalem and so forth, you know, you know, because it's, it's, you know, they know what it stands for. Well, let's look at um, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. You know, even, even during like the battle of Gog and Magog, or even during the uh, the Great Tribulation, you know, everybody says, oh, the capital is in Tel Aviv. They're not going, you know, the Antichrist and these people, they're not going to Tel Aviv, but when's the temple, when the temple gets rebuilt, where is it going to be rebuilt? It gets rebuilt in Jerusalem. It doesn't get rebuilt in, in Tel Aviv or something, you know, that, you know, people, the battle of and Magog, Russia and all them, and the Muslims, they go towards, they're heading towards Jerusalem. They're not trying to go towards Tel Aviv or something. You know, they know, you know, Satan knows that, that Jerusalem is God's God's city. So, so Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall, shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. So now the verses before this, we were just, you know, th this chapter, you know, remember it kind of started out at the end of the uh, Great Tribulation at the, at the Battle of Armageddon. You know, Jesus steps foot, comes down from heaven, steps foot back on the Mount of Olives, and, uh, you know, all that stuff that we talked about, the mountain splits and so forth. And then next thing you know, then we kind of go into the millennium. You know, we saw that, you know, where, you know, um, Jesus is there and they're living in safety and so forth. Now, in this verse, it goes back to the Great Tribulation at the Battle of Armageddon. So, you know, this verse brings us back to the Battle of Armageddon. So, you know, oftentimes the scripture, it, it goes that, it does, does things like that. It'll go back and forth or... You know, there's verses in Scripture where the first half of the verse will be talking about the first coming of Jesus, and then the second half, only separated by a comma or something, will be talking about the second second coming of Jesus. And, you know, verses like this will be doing the same thing. Here within this chapter, go back and forth to, uh, you know, sometimes God will show you something, and then he'll show you, you know, what's going to happen, you know, following it. And then he'll go into more detail and go, let's go back, okay, let's look at this a little closer at the, 
that of Armageddon or something. So, so verses 12 through 15 relate to the battle of Armageddon. So I said, so we're going to we go back to this. We're, we'll, these next verses, we're not going to get through them all today, but they relate to the battle of Armageddon. Now, God will bring a great plague upon all of Israel's enemies that fought against Jerusalem. You know, we see that, that um, you know, God, as I said, he's going to start protecting Jerusalem and starting with there in the Battle of Armageddon. Remember I said all these nations are going to be trying to destroy Jerusalem at the Battle of Armageddon, but God's going to allow these, these Jewish people to come back from, through that uh, valley that he created, and supernaturally he's going to help intervene, and they're going to be able to, to, to defeat them. You know, that, you know, from this point on, you know, God's no longer, you know, he, he allowed some destruction. But he's not going to allow it to be completely destroyed. And then as we saw in the millennium, then, you know, it's not going to allow Jerusalem to once again ever be attacked. And, be, you know, God always punishes Israel's enemies. He doesn't always do it right away. But in this case here, he's going to bring a great plague upon all of Israel's enemies. You know, so the ones that have fought against Jerusalem or trying to fight and so forth, God's going to bring this plague. You know, it's not even be something that's going to wait. You know, he's not going to, well, I'll get you 10 years later, like Babylon. He allowed them to punish Jerusalem, uh, Israel, you know, Judah, for those 70 years. But then they got their due at the end of 70 years, you know. So, you know, sometimes God puts things up. But in this case, he does not. You know, during this battle, he brings this great plague upon all of Israel's enemies that had fought against Jerusalem. Now, the verse says, God will smite all of the people, which means he will kill all the people as they die in this great plague. You know, this plague will consume away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes upon their holes and their tongues in their mouths. This plague will be swift and destructive as it will strike and destroy the people while they stand. You know, there is no time to think about escaping. You know, and again, he says all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. So it's not just going to be, okay, well, we'll say... You know, it's the uh, the Russians, or it's this group, or it's this group, or it's um, you know whatever. I mean, you know, it's it's all you know. It's not going to be the Chinese. What I mean, it's anybody. You know, and that, remember, the whole world during this battle is going to be trying to go there. You know, so it's again, it's not even just all of Europe or something. I mean, it's every nation in the world. All the people are going to be trying to go there. You know, except for obviously. Those that are saved, you know, that, you know, most of those are going to be have killed off anyway, but there'll be a few and they're still alive. But they're going to be trying to survive, you know, they're not going to be, you know, in, involved in this battle. But all those that are that are in this battle going to fight, and obviously not every single person is involved in this battle. They're just talking about the people that are fighting in this battle. You know, you know it's just like we go to war now, not every single person gets involved in the battle. But... All of those are going to be there. So we, we see, as I said, this, this plague, how it's describing, you know, I'll, I'll repeat this again because I want you to see this, how it will consume away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes upon their holes. And their, and their well, I'll read it from Scripture. It says, their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes shall consume away in their holes and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. So literally your tongue and your mouth here is going to, you know, just go away. And the eyes in your holes, you know, that, of course, that's your, your eyeballs, you know, within, you know, and so forth. And I said, it's going to be so swift. There's not going to be time to be thinking about escaping. You're not going to be thinking, oh, man, this is coming. I got to go. I see these people over here, you know, being consumed. I got to go. But the destruction given here is very similar to that scene in Japan after the atomic bombs were dropped. People were vaporized where they stood. You know, there's people that, that they've seen, there's images where when they were vaporized, they would leave an imprint of the person or something, you know, on a wall or, or something like that. And, I mean, literally, you get vaporized, there's nothing there. There's nothing left, nothing to bury. There's no, you know, everything's gone. You know, even the clothes and stuff would be gone. But it's, um, you know, it, and they were consumed by the nuclear blast. You know, so this may refer to some type of nuclear explosion or it may be a supernatural plague directly from Jesus when he returns. You know, so it has a lot of descriptions that sound just like a nuclear type blast that 
as I said, this was describing, even though it didn't get vaporized there when we dropped the bomb, atomic bombs on Japan, then a lot of them had things like this where they had all of this, these, uh, you know, the eyeballs consumed, you know, the uh, eat away part of your tongue. I mean, the, you know, not only that, but a lot of these people, they, they you know, that, that didn't die initially, died not long afterwards from all the radiation, the severe radiation, which the radiation eats away at your tongue and your eyeballs and all these things. So, you know, it, it, even if it's not something done right away, it doesn't take long and these things would start to happen. So, you know, we've seen those things, so it's possible this could be referring to some type of nuclear explosion. And of course, the weapons we have today, the nuclear bombs we have today, are far more powerful than what we used on Japan. So, you know, the things that were done to the people off of those bombs would be greatly magnified on these. So you'd definitely be seeing that consuming of the flesh and so forth type thing. You know, certainly a lot more people would be getting vaporized and, and so forth. But like I said, it also could just simply be a supernatural plague directly from Jesus. You know, we don't, you know, we don't, we always try to make it like it's something that we have that's just being used by God. And it's possible that some of these things, when we get into Revelation, we'll see that. Because many theologians believe that nuclear weapons will be used during the Great Tribulation. And it is possible that they are referred to here. But the plague, whatever it refers to, will at least have similar effects to a nuclear blast. And it will be a quick death. You know, this, I think for the most part, these, you know, this will be a quick death. And, but, you know, whatever it is, whether it's really a nuclear blast or it's something else supernaturally from God, it's going to have the effects similar to what we, we saw there with the nuclear blast. But I think, you know, and I, I'm not saying that, you know, it certainly sounds like a nuclear type blast. So, I mean, it's certainly possible. And, um, so I'm not going to say it's 100% is, but I'm not going to say it's it's not either. But I, I do think that sometimes some theologians, they get get into studying these things, and we try to always make things like, we try to relate it to what we have, that, you know, we say, oh, God, use this. They'll say, well, it's talking about horses. You're like the battle of Gaga Mega. It was talking about horses, and the people are like, well, really, you know, John didn't know how to describe it. You know, he's really talking about tanks or he's talking about airplanes. Now, again, I'm not saying that some of those things, it isn't possible, but I think, again, we need to take Scripture literally unless it tells us otherwise. And that we see the things that's going on over in Russia now. How I said that when it, we were, I was doing my study on uh, the Battle of Gog and Magog, and things have gotten even worse, that Russia's lost a lot, a lot of tanks. You know, it's lost a good percentage of its tanks. So it just makes sense that, you know, plus when you're fighting in the mountains, tanks don't work that well. So... You know, it just makes sense with horses, and Russia already has a bunch of horses in the military anyway. So, you know, these are things that, you know, we say, well, you know, it's referring to airplanes or, or tanks or whatever. Why cannot be horses? You know, who's to say that something happens? I mean, plus what happens if we, you know, an EMF pulse, somebody starts launching a bunch of those things, and all of our weapons like tanks and airplanes, those things don't work anymore, but horses still go. So, you know, horses would work. So, you know... I just, you know, I'm not going to say, like I said, that it's not nuclear bombs. I mean, I've, I think it's a good possibility that it could be. But I think we just have to be careful that, you know, sometimes we try to always make something, you know, we, we forget that God can just do whatever he wants. That You know, he doesn't have to necessarily use weapons that we have. That You know, he could just speak the word and have angels drop some supernatural plague that we don't even have here on earth or whatever yet or something. So... You know, it could and it could just be similar effects of what is seen with a nuclear blast or something. So, you know, but um, it's definitely, like I said, whether it is nuclear blast or not, it definitely has the same descriptive uh, things to it. And it'll definitely be quick deaths. You know, I don't think this is something, this is not something that's going to be dragged out. So, but anyway, we'll, we'll pick it up next week in verse 13 and... We'll look at, you know, some more of this, these events. Because remember, 13, 14, and 15, I'll mention again next week, but they're still dealing with here the Great Tribulation. But we'll, we'll pick it up next week in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 13. Let's have a word of prayer. So, Father, we thank you for the things that you do for us each and every day. We thank you for allowing us to study on your word. And, and Father, I do pray that that uh, you'll give me the wisdom to understand all these things that, such as that is 
you know, if it really is truly a nuclear blast or if it's just something supernaturally from you, God. And, and uh, just we want to make sure we're, we're teaching the right things. But sometimes it's, it's not always super clear, at least not to me, that uh, what these things could be. And I just don't want to be like some people and try to make everything seem like it's uh, some weapon that we have, which, you know, it's possible. But I, I, like I said, I don't want to minimize you, Lord, that your power, the, the things that you can do. So, you know, you, you could have something created just for that moment that um, man has never seen before. And so, you know, whatever it is that we want, want you to get the glory, God. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless the rest of the day and bless the week and pray for a safe return on Sunday and just, again, put a hedge around your servant here and those that are listening online and those that are listening here. And uh, the Father, be with each and every one. Just bless all of them. Keep us all healthy and safe. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.